Hi everyone, this is Jan Hunt. Sorry, my computer's making noises. Hopefully you didn't hear that. Um, Melissa is out on vacation today, so as the vice chair, um, I am filling in. Um, so we won't be hearing from Melissa today. We have a lot on the agenda. Um, I'm really excited to hear about Oregon Buys update because we haven't met since we went live with Oregon Buys. So um, I'll be curious to hear um, what there is to share and also um, interested in the questions and answers. Um, I know at our agency, we are learning a ton about Oregon Buys. And then we have Court and Karen here to talk about camp contracting for temporary employees. We'll also have a legislative update from Jay Jackson and Debbie Dennis. And then um, I hope we are prepared for this. Um, we are actually going to do breakout rooms in teams and talk about what's been um, working. How has working remotely been going? What's been working well? Um, what have some of the challenges been? What have we really learned? What does the future um, look like? So that's what we have on um, the agenda for the day. And Nicole, are you ready to talk about Oregon buys? Sure, let me share my screen here. Okay, hopefully folks can see the presentation okay. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Um, so, a little bit about what we plan to cover today. So, as far as an agenda, we want to give um, an update on where we are, the current project status, talk about upcoming project deliverables, um, do a demonstration of using the advanced search. Uh, talk about ORS 190 entities and supplier accounts. We've been getting a lot of questions around that. Um, what we have learned in um, now that phase one has come to a close and then some time for questions and answers. So let's jump into it here. Um, so as far as the current project status, we have successfully replaced Orphan. Um, we're working to build up the marketplace that continues daily in Oregon buys. Um, Orpin remains now in an archive mode, so folks can still log into Orpin. Um, you can still uh, access documents. It's just no changes can be made to those documents. Um, so as of when we pulled these numbers, I think end of last week, we were at um, 1,435 contracts in Oregon buys that are in sent status, and then 14,406 are in progress. And that number includes all of the, um, the ORS 190s that are in the system that are being worked as well. So we know there is a significant portion of those in progress master blankets that are ORS 190s. We held an agency forum this morning so that we could give um, agencies an overview of what's coming in phase two. It was very well attended. I thought that that went really well, so I was excited to see um, to see that and get some participation, get some really good questions from folks in the audience. And then as far as preparing for phase two scope, um, Again, just to kind of reiterate, and if folks weren't able to attend this morning, um, phase two really includes capturing all of the procurement spend through Oregon buys. Um, it will also include uh, doing actual cart purchases using Marketplace. So right now folks are going into Marketplace and they're just kind of browsing to see if there are statewide price agreements um, for a specific good or service. This way you'll actually be able to put things in your cart and then process that cart. Um, we'll be creating work order contracts associated with price agreements. We will be doing um, requisitions to purchase from existing agreements, so internal requisitions. And we will be generating purchase orders to vendors um, to order goods and services. And what that means is that um, if we send a purchase order to the vendor, the vendor will get an email. They will log into Oregon Buys and they'll be able to access that purchase order electronically in the system. 
Um, we will be creating receipts to identify delivery of goods and services. So we'll be doing receiving. We'll be processing invoices. And those would be invoices that either were received through Oregon buys or if a hard copy invoice was received. And then um, expanding on business intelligence reporting. So I'm going to pull up the next slide as well. Um, I really like this graphic and I know you guys have probably seen this before, but I think it gives a good representation of the different functionality pieces that will be rolled out with phase two. So everything that's outlined in the red boxes right now was rolled out with phase one of the project. And then as we move towards phase two, um, everything that's outlined with the blue outline is coming in phase two. So when your agency goes through their wave, these will be the things that um, we'll be rolling out as far as a procure to pay type of function. So the vendors will start accepting orders and sending invoices in the system. Um, we'll be doing that that um, shopping cart processing using marketplace all of these requisition processes will start happening inside of oregon buys so initiating requisitions doing automated approval paths um, purchase orders and receiving and then processing invoices and sending those to our stars or teams depending on which agency you're with um, to release payment um, and then again information around spend and data reporting enterprise-wide at agency and getting down to that granular um, item level information on spend. So with that, are there any questions on kind of what's coming here with phase two? Let me see if I can pull up the chat here as well to make sure we're not missing anything. It doesn't look like it, okay. We move to our next slide. All right, so Carter, I'm gonna hand this one to you to talk about deliverables. Thank you, Nicole. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, just briefly go over where we are in the project and we wanted to do a six month outlook in project deliverables, but um, I wanna just go through the activities um, that we're currently working on um, and get us out to um, November. So I guess first thing to note is that my today uh, milestone needs to be moved underneath the phase two agency forum milestone. This was put together for our executive steering committee last week. So I didn't update it. Um, but the work that is going on in joint project team is to finalize the detailed plans uh, for our procure to pay uh, component of the project in wave one. Um, we're, and as part of that, we're doing some refinements to the schedule. Um, so that's a that's a key work activity that should be um, completed by 1st of September. And I've got a milestone there where we have executive steering committee approval of the new schedule baseline. Um, other work that's going on, we've been engaged with a uh, joint project team um, in the uh, phase one retrospective lessons learned. Um, also, there's um, a uh, a lessons learned survey that we've distributed to stakeholders. So if you see that in your inbox and haven't uh, been able to reply to it, it would be great if you could get that um, in, any information back to us because we're really trying to uh, do process improvement as we move through. Um, beginning September, um, we're going to be engaged in the enterprise to be process design. So we really need to design the enterprise configuration before we can configure any of the agencies. Ideally, the agencies can adopt or, or piggyback off of the enterprise to be designed. So that's the key work that's going on in uh, September. And that will move us into the enterprise functional testing uh, in, in, at, the, uh, end of, uh, at the middle of October. Um, and the enterprise functional testing is gonna be uh, performed using uh, an interagency multidiscipline uh, team um, of folks uh, from, I think we have 11 different um, organizations um, and uh, roles from procurement, um, uh, accounts payable and other business users. So those are the key activities. Um, and I've pinpointed the uh, deliverables milestones on here. Um, we have the 
Um, we have the wave one kickoff that is a deliverable scheduled for 10-1. Um, we have um, the updated functional design, which is a deliverable uh, due first week in uh, October. Um, and then at end of, uh, end of October, our updated end-to-end -end plan should be um, uh, completed. That will be going through an independent quality management services review. Uh, so that's uh, out there a little bit longer, has a long, um, a long lead time. And then finally, uh, second week in uh, November, um, we'll have our satisfactory uh, enterprise test report completed. So that's what I have for you. Any questions on upcoming uh, project deliverables? I have a question. This is Archana from DOJ. Um, I was in your forum t this morning, and your timeline for wave one is August 21 to April 22. Here, uh, I'm a little bit confused um, because you have a kickoff there for wave one. What what does that entail when there when the when the wave one um, is indicated to start August twenty one? Okay, right. Um, the wave one kickoff deliverable is is a meeting that will be um, an event um, where we have all of the participant uh, participating agencies in wave one. Um, on a on a call and walking through um, the plan for those agencies in wave one. We've expanded the idea of wave one uh, to include the um, the enterprise configuration work that we're doing. So that might be the confusion. Does that help? Yeah, and so so this will pretty much look like the same for wave one, uh, wave two and three. Um, I'm, I'm thinking, and then just so that you all know, wave three, or DOJ is in wave three, and wave three's final live, going live time is at the end of the biennium in June 2023. So again, you know, this was kind of stressful for all of us at the end of this biennium that the transition occurred, the ORPIN transition occurred right here. Um, so I just want you to be aware of that and, and, and we'll be asking a lot of questions on how you're going to take us through that. Um, and, not, and now it's not just the procurement people that will be involved in this transition. It's going to be a lot of people involved in the agency, you know, with approval paths and such. Yes, exactly. Thank you so much for, um, for that comment. And we are um, trying to um, factor those things into our planning at this point. So really appreciate the comment. Other questions? Nicole, kick it back to you. Perfect, thanks. I was checking in the chat and I don't see anything there. So I think we're good to move forward to the next slide. I think I'm going to hand it over to Jenny at this point. Jenny, I will stop sharing my screen so that you can take us through a demo of using advanced search. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me do this. Um, so um, one of the asks actually for um, for our participation today was to talk to to talk about what kind of management tools. Um, that may be through reporting. Um, and um, and so um, they're just, it, my screen is showing, correct? I see the red box. Yes, it is. Okay, all right. Um, and so I wanna show, I would just wanna make sure everyone knows where the reports are and, um, and that they're just, they're really just a, at this point, they're just a few that really have anything in them. You know, we're just building data. But um, just just to be to be clear, this gear here is the is where you find the reports. And so I'm in um, in the DAS organization and pull reports. And there is then this list of what we call canned reports. Um, 
And a couple that, that I have found to be useful, um, one was expiring contracts. And that is something I know people have, have asked, uh, VPs have asked about it. And now that, so right here, you do expiring contracts and um, you select your agency. I happen to just have two. Um, and I want to just look at uh, 30. You can do 30 days up to 120 days. But if I want to look at what's coming up, I do the 30 days. I apply it. And I say OK, and here's the buyer and their agreements that are going to expire. So that that may be a helpful report over there. Um, if you are questioning locations and um, and departments, there is um, there is that um, uh, department list by location um, is is a way to kind of if as, as we move forward and you start um, building more out or trying to remember the various organizations locations within your agency. So this is just an example of how um, DAS is built out and the, all of the locations underneath that. So that would be available for your agency. The the report down here that's MBPA MBPO QA report um, was created um, so that you can you can look at um, kind of your pro progress on moving the uh, contracts and ORS 190s to sent status. And um, so right now, um, if I look at um, like DAS on behalf of, I mean, we, we still have a lot of agency specific contracts that were moved over and you can pull a report or you can export it to export what all is in each person's um, in their queue. So that's um, that is probably of interest. We're not reporting this meeting on the number that are that are still in progress because um, we all still have a lot. So we'll we'll we had said we're going to you know we wanted contracts in 60 days. So. Certainly, let's all still work to that, but we're not we're not highlighting that this meeting. Um, so um, the other um, so you can get in here approval paths. There was an ask for us to share what approval paths were, but when we pull it, um, it's a one page for each approval path and it, it got it, it wasn't very useful information. So I think that's why we had said, could we have a discussion and hear from agencies on that? But these are all out here. We are working we've we've finalized the um, several of the, the bigger reports. Um, the COVID report is in its its last review stages. We've got a commodity report in its last stages. Um, so there's several um, custom reports that pull across a lot of information and um, soon, um, probably by next month, I'll be able to tell you how to access those. So that's on reports. Um, but what I really discovered is that there's there's as much or more information in the advanced search um, right here. And so if I want to go in and see what bid solicitations are um, posted, actually, I think I can do that from here. Um, so you do here, I do bid solicitations. And then this is really your sorting criteria. So if I want to know um, you know, what's in in progress, what's uh, what's ready to send, what's ready to approval, what's what's in sent status. Um, if you select your department, I thought in this I should have only had uh, procurement services. Um, and 
see what we get here. So at this point, um, there is just uh, Nick Betsicon has started one, and this is um, this is in DAS procurement services. Um, most of what we're doing is in DAS OBO and the DAS on behalf of, but you all would be able to go in and look at, um, let's say, purchase orders in advanced search. If I want to know um, how, what purchase orders, um, well, we'll say Nick Betsicon has, since we saw that he had there, you just select and search. And again, there's not much in this organization because most of our work in this one is statewide price agreements. Um, but I just wanted to show you that this advanced search, once you select the document, what you want to look for, then um, all of, you can sort by the commodity code, by the buyer, by the NIGP class, um, and by bid solicitation number, if you're, if you know a number that you're working on, and you can look at any person in your organization's work within your organization. So that's a, a quick and dirty of just some of the tools um, that are that are at your fingertips. Are there questions? So Jenny, there were a few in the chat. Um, the first one was from Tony. Is there a plan to capture the Orpen contracts that were entered after the list to move them over to Oregon buys was pulled? So Tony, is that is that saying that there were additional contracts entered into Orpen after the the list to upload them into Oregon buys had already been pulled? Uh, yes, we or I think we had to have our due date was like to have it done by the first week of May. And so anything between May and the end of June, um, I was wondering how how to handle those. So we we did this the second load on the on July second from that second spreadsheet that you all provided. So everything should be in there at this point. If if yes, if it was on a spreadsheet that you gave us, it should be in there. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. What else? Okay, and then um, Sharon had asked about the path to show us the path to reports again, and I just uh, typed in there. So for folks, you click the gear icon in the upper right corner and select reports. So it's pretty quick and easy to get to those. Right there. Right there. Thank you. Yep. Um, and then Julia asks, is there a report or search for the price agreements and if they are mandatory or convenience or a full report like we had in Orpen? There is not. And um, that is, uh, those are two reports um, that, not the mandatory inconvenience, but the statewide price agreements. Um, our Daisha Heck at Periscope did run that report. Um, we, we're having to pull it, not based on a statewide, but all agreements that are open to all organizations. And so I'm working on trying to get that published. So I'm sorry that's not been as straightforward. The mandatory and convenience, um, there's not a field for it. It would be a custom column. I was not aware, honestly, of how many convenience agreements there are, but there are. Um, as a workaround, in fact, I had just asked Amy um, and Nicole if we could do a link to at least uh, a spreadsheet for the short term. Um, until we get some consistent way to get those marked in in Oregon by. So that's um, I, I have. We have a list um, and I want to try to make it easy for reference. It's um, quite a few portfolios, so that's. Um, yeah, we don't want to have to send you back to Orphan to check, so we'll we're working on a workaround. Lori Doak did hers and did put the information in a column, but it's a column that is actually being removed in an upgrade. So what we thought we had figured out isn't gonna work. So, um, 
Okay, and I think that's it in the chat. Were there any other questions on on what Jenny showed us or on being able to pull this data? Is there an easy way to search for ORS 190s? Uh, let me let me come back to you on that, Sabrina. I'm not positive. I have not, but I will I will see. So I will say on that. Um, so the the column that captures whether or not something is an ORS 190 is a custom column. So I doubt it's in the canned report right out of the gate from Oregon buys, but it might be something we could add. Thanks. Yes. OK. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jenny. Um, I'm going to see if I can go back here and share the PowerPoint and we can continue on. All right. Um, so next, I wanted to talk about that ORS 190 entity. So we have been getting quite a few questions on this, um, and the question is really around what should we do if an ORS-190 entity is not yet registered as a supplier in Oregon buys? So because we are putting all of our ORS-190s into the system as a master blanket purchase order, that means that the other entity um, in, that, in that agreement needs to have a vendor registration, a supplier account to be able to link it to. Um, so the agency should contact that entity directly and ask them to create a supplier account. So basically there's a, there's a few little steps here. Have them navigate to the Oregon Buys website and click on the blue register button in the upper right corner. Um, it will require a tax ID. So um, they're able to see pretty quickly if they've, they've already got a registration in the system because it's going to tell them that tax ID is in use. Um, there's a note here that says DAS is not doing the outreach to all the ORS 190s um, and Periscope support desk is unable to contact the entities who need a supplier account for ORS 190s. Those are questions we've received. Um, but to point out this big helpful tip here in the blue box, um, it's pretty easy to look in the system to see if that entity has a supplier account. So when you're logged in, you can use that advanced search tool that Jenny was just showing us. And one of the drop downs in that advanced search is to look through the vendor registrations. Um, and so you can just put in their that um, entity's name or, or a portion of their name might actually probably suggest a portion um, just in case maybe they used and instead of an ampersand or something like that. Um, but you should be able to look and see if they had registered yet in the system. Are there any questions on that? That's when we get quite a few quite a few emails about. So I just want to stop and see if there's any any additional clarification needed. Looks like perhaps let me see if I can get back to this. Um, how are we to know if the other agency put the ORS 190 in already? Is, is there some direction of which agency should be on point to put it? So um, I'm not as familiar with this and maybe somebody else can speak to it who's more familiar with the ORS 190s, but I do know at least in the in the template that I saw, um, like the the, it looked like, I don't know if it was a DAS template, but there's a piece right there that asks you to clarify who the first agency is and the second agency. And then it talks about the fact that it's the, the responsibility of the first agency to report it. Um, but this is sort of outside of the Oregon buys realm. So I don't know if anybody else has any additional guidance around that part. I'm not hearing any. Um, so what I could say is you could do um, searches just using that same advanced search like Jenny was showing. You could do searches to see. Um, I think vendor is one of the options that you can do a master blanket purchase order search by. So you could look to see if your organization um, is a vendor listed on any of them because that hopefully would let you see what ORS 190s have been assigned with your agency as the vendor. Um, that might be a place to start. Jenny, would you be interested in providing guidance to agencies on this so we don't duplicate work? Sure, we'll we'll go back. I'm going to answer on Jenny's behalf. 
<laughs> we'll, we'll go back and, and create some guidance on this so that we can share that out to folks. Nicole, Jan I yeah, I, I think that there's another issue too in that in IAAs, it spells that out, but not necessarily in IGAs with counties and cities and yeah. that sort of thing. So I think it would be great if we could get some guidance on this. Okay, and then just a reminder too on to that point, Jan. So the um, the ORCAP members are not putting uh, contracts into the system. So if it's an IGA with another governmental entity that's not a state agency, the other governmental entity would not have a way to report it in Oregon buys. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Portland uses this system, so if they put it in, do we put it in too? I hope I'm not going to answer this incorrectly, but I believe Portland is a client of Periscope, so they're putting these into their own instance of Oregon uh, or of uh, EPRO. Um, Jenny, is that correct? Yes, yes, it's completely separate from our system. Okay, and then Josh, uh, yes, please. Comprehensive guidance on the various ORN, ORS-190 agreements would be helpful. Okay, I think we could take that back and um, and work on that either for next month or maybe something we can distribute in the interim. Okay, um, let's look at the next slide here. Jenny, back to you for the lessons learned from phase one. Oh, okay. Um, the, um, we're, we're, Gathering the information, we we reviewed the project team. We did ours first, but now um, really need to see what all of those that were um, that were involved. And so um, I know it was just another ask, another little body of work, but um, as much feedback as we can get is helpful. We really, really, really are taking this to heart, and um, I know. Um, already we're making pretty significant changes in how the core teams will operate in phase two. Um, so we we need to hear from you. Um, the survey is actually closes this Friday. So if you haven't had a chance, please do and um, please do complete it. And we will be sharing the lessons learned um, in some format. But more importantly, we hope you just see see the the improvements and changes um, as we move forward to phase two. So that's really all on that. Okay, thank you. So I think at this point, and I know we're pretty close on time, um, so we are to the point of a Q&A session, and I know we've sort of answered all the questions that have come in through chat, but is there anything else that folks want us to cover? I'm not seeing anything else in chat um, and hopefully folks were able to join us this morning and got some of your questions answered around phase two. Um, so I think with that, Jan, I'll Nicole, this is Julie Hall. I have a question. Sure. So I'm on um, Oregon Buys right now. So actually I have two questions. Okay. So A, how can I find out which vendors received my solicitation that I sent out? Second of all, there is a field called alternate ID that's on the general tab that does not allow data entry in it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And I thought we were going to allow data entry into that field? So I'm going to answer those out of order. <laughs> so the okay. alt ID field is actually used for the interfaces. So for example, when you're looking at a vendor, um, the alt ID field on the vendor is used to house the R stars number. So we have all of the alt ID fields locked down um, for editing because they're used for the various interfaces or for other kind of uh, activity that happens in the background of the system. So we don't want anybody editing or adding data into those fields. Okay. Um, and then as far as your question around 
how you can look to see which vendors were notified of the bid. So remember that is a step that the buyer takes when they create their bid. One of the tabs is the bidders tab. They'll go in and they can do searches for vendors. The easiest way to do the search and the one that we have recommended using is to use the button to look up all the vendors that can provide the commodity codes that you're using on your bid. And then there's just one button that you click to add all of those folks to that list. So that bidders tab will show you all of the um, vendors that the email notifications were pushed out to. If it's blank, that means you did not put any on there. So you wanna make sure that you're going through and putting those as you're working through the tabs, that you're populating that tab. Um, so, so even if you've pressed unrestricted bid, all vendors can view and respond. That doesn't mean it went out to the world if you do the unrestricted bid and it will post it on oregon buy so that it's visible to everybody but it won't actually push out email notifications unless you populate that bidders tab thank you uh-huh all right thank you so much um nicole and crew for the update it's been really really helpful um and we'll probably have you back next month for another update Sounds great, thank you. Thanks. So just one little, um, I'm sure that everybody's doing a lot of different things to learn more about Oregon Buys. I just wanna share one of the things that we are doing. Um, my team meets every week and we share what we've learned about Oregon Buys. We share little trips, little tricks, little tips. Um, things that we didn't potentially know about, people ask questions, and it, we found it to be really, really helpful. So just a tip on that. Um, so Court and Karen are up to talk about contracting for temporary services. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm, really, we want Karen to talk since she's been <laughs> dealing with the DOJ attorneys on um, on the employment side. But I really wanted to work to talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can start it off. What we're talking about is not temporary services, but temporary when you're bringing people in to do work for you. So it's something that we've always kind of probably known in the back of our minds. And we sent out a brief um, buyer's link, I think, to our DPO council link with uh, um, some guidance that we developed. But what we need and the state needs more than, you know, individually us or, you know, DAS procurement, we need you to look at whenever you're doing a contract or using Galt or any of the other uh, QRF Oregon Forward teams or Oregon Forward vendors to make sure you're engaging with your HR shop. What we're trying to do is find out, are you a quasi employer, an employer or not an employer? Because there are things where you can run into the problem where you hire a staff and DPO at an agency and they come to me and say, hey, our whole front desk and the people that answer the phone for our agency are going to be on vacation for two weeks and I need someone there. So you go to Galt or whoever and you say, I need two staff to cover this time frame. And the two staff show up and one of them says, oh, I have an ADA accommodation I need. Well, the federal law says you probably have to provide it. So you need to be thinking about these things. There's a, there's, there's a whole raft of things. That's why we want your HR shop involved. Um, there's a difference now. We're, we're not talking about you're hiring someone to do programming. You need a, a program written, a computer software program, where you go out and you say, hey, I need software that does this. And you basically toss over to them. They work whenever they want. They may not even be in Oregon, but you know they're within your RFP and they're doing your work. And then when they're done, they toss it back to you. You're not telling them, you're not do. you have no care, custody, and control, for lack of a better word, over them. They're working when they want. You don't tell them what language to program in. You don't tell them, you know, what hours they have to work. You may tell them where they have to do progress notes, but you're not telling them what to do or how to do it, just what the end product is. I'm generalizing horribly here for time. Um, the other thing then is, so if you're bringing a body onto your site, your getting much closer to employing them, even though you have a contract with someone that says they're an independent contractor. There are lots of laws that say, well, part of them might be, but part of them may not. 
So what you're going to need to do is work with the, the group, the entity that's providing the body to you, the human, and saying, we know that we may be a quasi uh, responsible for some of this stuff. So we want to shift you to become responsible for all of it, even though, so if we have to buy them a special mouse while they're here for a month, that's fine, but you get to pay for it. And then you, employer, you, that mouse now belongs to you. You send it, you know, so if we call them back, we've already bought it. You take it with them. So I'm doing really high level, but uh, we can have Karen do some talking. And, you know, just to follow up on what Court is saying, I think the important issue here is some of these temporary workers may be deemed to be joint temporary employees, and that's the issue. So the minute they become a joint employee, they are an employee of the state of Oregon. And that, of course, gets them into all the benefits and all those wonderful types of things that we as true employees get. We need to be definitely working with your HR groups every time that you get somebody in, a temporary worker, no matter what it's for. And I think there are certain protections, as Court was saying, for the project level. Uh, again, when you look at independent contractors and employees, you're looking at control. Basically, that's what you're looking at and how they're doing their job, those types of things, where they sit, what times they're working, all of those issues that you typically see in an employment contract. With the independent contractors that are doing deliverable based or the project ones, basically what the state is saying is, I want X. I don't care how you do it. I don't care when you do it. I need it X by date zero. So those are a little clearer that they really do not become an employee of the state of Oregon. But again, we've got to be very careful. So I think the adage that we really want to talk to you about as we're all coming back in together, uh, talk to your HR groups anytime you're doing this. And the one thing that I will tell you is these temporary situations are showing up under a lot of different contracts. You think about Galt and the QR or the Oregon Forwards. You think about the IT professional services. You think about some of your contracts that are agency specific that have the ability to get people in to help you do certain things. So it can sneak up in you on you in any place. So be very very careful. But of course, um, DOJ and DAS are more than happy to answer any specific questions. We don't want to go into any specifics right now. But again, we're happy to answer any specific questions offline. And uh, I believe, Karen, correct me, I think that the labor and employment section of DOJ has reached out to all the HR, the HR groups in the state, the HR they, managers group. They have. They've been at their meeting, I think, the middle of July. They were at, actually DOJ was at the whatever whatever they call their monthly meeting for all the HR folks. So again, it's the idea that we've got to work in concert with HR. Any questions? Lots of concerns, I'm sure, but any questions? <laughs> All right. Well, it doesn't appear that there are any questions that anybody. Popped, there was one. Yeah. One oh, popped okay. up. It says Karen isn't the risk of an independent contractor being considered an employee when we hire a single member LLC or individual, but not when we hire a company. Um, I would tell you the risk goes up when it's just one person, um, but the risk is still there even with the companies. You think about Covendus, everybody. I'm, I'm going to throw out Covendus. When your lawyer knows the name of the contractor that you are obtaining under one of those work order contracts, you probably have a problem. Um, <laughs> because it, go, it goes down to the temporary employee. That's what it's judged on, not necessarily the company or who we have the contract with. I hope that answered the question for Derek. Yes, he says. Perfect. But talk Thanks, to HR. Karen. Yep, talk to yep. HR. Thanks, Court. All right. Thank you, Karen.
Thank you, Court. Really good information. Um, and next we have, I think Jay and Debbie are both here. I know I saw Debbie. Yes, Jay. I'm Dan. Um, I believe Jay is on vacation, um, oh. but I am here and prepared to give a brief update on the House Bill 2374. Um, so uh, uh, as we probably told you last month, we are developing a training. Um, it's going to be available online. Um, we're thinking it'll probably be eligible for like a point towards our certifications. Um, it's going to be just a short 20 to 30 minute online training available through the learning management system sort of on demand. Um, and so that is really going to cover um, just at a high level what the discretionary preferences are. And then it'll kind of dive into some examples of maybe how to apply the preferences, some examples of how to do that. Um, so uh, Kelly Mix is online. I don't know when that training is going to be available, but I believe it's in the next four to six weeks. And Kelly, our goal um, right now, uh, Debbie and all, is to have that available right around the first of September, uh, maybe the first full week in September. We'll keep okay. you up. Excellent. And then uh, the second piece is how we will be collecting the information from agencies on our use of discretionary preferences. And so um, we have met internally as a DAS team to kind of go over a couple of different options. Um, and then I also uh, met with a couple of different DPOs, Melissa Canfield included as the chair of this committee. Um, to to uh, sort of float the different options we were considering. And the one that we've landed on is um, as follows. We will we will pull the total um, the, the bill requires us to report out um, the number and value of contracts that were executed during a specific period of time during the during this peer, reporting period. We can pull that from Oregon Vice. So there really won't be any, any additional action needed on, on behalf of the agencies. The, the area we're going to need your help is when your staff does conduct a solicitation and use a discretionary preference, we're going to need to know a little bit of information about that. And so what we've come up with is we are going to pull um, out of Oregon buys a report. Um, we're shooting for every two weeks. Um, that report will give us at DAS a listing of all new contracts that have been implemented in, the, in that period, in those two weeks, that were the result of a solicitation. And it will give us some basic data points about those contracts, the not to exceed value, the contract number, the solicitation number, but most importantly, who the procurement officer is. Um, we will be sending a, a form, an electronic form, to these uh, procurement officers that have let these contracts, and it'll have, it'll be about, a, it'll take probably two to three minutes to fill out the form. Our goal is to get that into their hands within a couple weeks after they finalize a contract, and we're hoping that most of the information is just top of mind, that they're not going to have to be pulling out files and digging around to answer the questions. The questions will be pretty much, we have record that you just finished this contract. It was a result of solicitation XYZ. Um, did you use any discretionary, discretionary preferences in your solicitation? If they say no, they did not. Um, it'll be a yes or no question. So if they say no, um, then they will just be given sort of a pick list of the most common reasons that we think preferences are not used. So it'll say things like um, uh, none of the preferences were applicable or we were using federal funds and preferences are prohibited. Um, and so we will be coming up with a list of what we think those most common um, uh, reasons are. And then there will be a spot for other if they have some other reason then we'd like a, a sentence about what that reason was. Um, and then that would be the end of the survey if they are the form, if they did not use a preference. If they did use a preference, if they answered yes, uh, we used a discretionary preference, 
Uh, then they will be directed to a pick list of what the discretionary preferences are, and we'd like them to check off any of the ones that they utilized. And then we will have sort of an open-ended comment box about how did the use of this preference impact your solicitation. Um, and then we will collect that information and compile it over time and use that to prepare the report that's due back um, to the legislature. Um, by using this method and the tool that we're using to send out these automated forms, we will also be able to track if we're getting the response or not getting the response. Um, we can also report to agency DPOs if you want to know are your folks you know, filling these things out. We can we can run reports and let you know um, if if we're getting the information back. So um, anyway, I that is a that is the extent of the update that I have today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I did forget one important detail, and that is we hope to have the first report um, sent out in the month of August. So I had a couple questions. One, is there a way when you get the form done that it can be sent out to the DPOs just so that we can kind of have an idea what it's going to look like? Yes. OK. And then my second question is, I think that we have to go back to the beginning of June to gather the information. Is that correct? Yes. OK. And so did you address how we're going to handle going back to the beginning of June if we're using Oregon buys for July going forward? I did not mention that, but we will just do a, a historical poll for the month of June out of um, Orpen. OK, perfect. Thank you. You bet. Any other questions from the group or comments? All right. Thank you, Debbie. I um, I guess one of the other um, questions might be, um, are there any other legislative um, um, bills that passed that people have concerns about or want to share? All right. So um, this next thing, we were supposed to do a round table um, to kind of talk about working remotely, what's when, what's what well, what hasn't gone well, all those sorts of things. Um, we were supposed to do breakout rooms, and I don't have the ability to do that. So there's two options. One, we could ask Debbie Dennis to do it, because she, I think, has that ability, but I don't know if she's used it before or can do that for us. Or two, Debbie. Yeah. Is that something <laughs> you can do or want to do? I have no idea how to do it. <laughs> um, uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't know how to do that. OK, since Debbie doesn't know how to do it or hasn't done it before, what I'm going to suggest then is that we defer this to a meeting in the future. Um, unless there is a burning desire for people just to do it via round table, which I don't think is going to be very effective. All right. We are just going to go ahead and move this forward to a future agenda so that we can do the round table or not round table. Sorry, I keep messing that up. Um, so that we can do it via breakout rooms, which will be a new and exciting experience for us. Um, so we're going to end the meeting um, ahead of schedule, which will give everybody a little bit of time. Um, the meeting wrap, wrap up is really supposed to be about agency happenings. Is there anybody out there that has anything to share with the group about what's going on with their agencies? Kelly. Hi. Hi. Hey. Oh, Hello, folks. There's two things I wanted to mention real quick for DAS procurement services. Uh, 
One, we are in the final um, phases of the recruitment process to bring on a new procurement services manager. Um, hopefully we'll have something will be announced between um, now and the next DPO meeting. Um, this is position person that we hire. We haven't got there yet, but we're hoping to hire. We'll be stepping into the position that Court Dawkins is currently in. Uh, in the next couple of months, Court's going to be um, returning to retirement. I only gave him a two-day retirement the first time. So um, I just want to say here again how much I appreciate um, the Court coming back and being with us for the last four months. And um, so just that was just an update on that recruitment process. Second to that, we have um, a recruitment active right now for Research Analyst 3. Uh, that position is going to be very squarely focused on the data um, available in Oregon Buys, being able to, to mine that data, produce reports, help us make better sourcing decisions out of that data. This is a reposting for this position. We didn't have a strong applicant pool the first time around. So if you're aware of folks in or outside of government who may have a background in research and analytics who would be interested in that, please point them to um, Workday and ask them to take a look at our recruitment. Those are the two things I had, Jan. Thanks, Kelly. Seems like there was somebody else. Sean? Yeah, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Sean McCormick with the Military Department. Uh, one of the pieces of legislation that passed during the most recent session was House Bill 2927. That is going to be uh, removing the Office of Emergency Management from the military department's portfolio uh, and standing them up as an independent agency. Uh, so we'll be bringing along, uh, I'll be bringing along a representative from, from OEM probably in the next you know, three to six months to join the, the DPO conversation uh, as they'll have their own new internal uh, designated procurement officer. They'll fall under the same type of authorities that we have. So DAS will do things for them that are over $150,000. Uh, but my office has been uh, supporting all of their intermediate procurement purchases for the last 15 years. So it'll be a pretty big, uh, pretty big changeover for them. So there'll be a new rep uh, for the new Department of Emergency Management. Uh, and that, come, that becomes effective uh, 1 July of 2022. And that's it. Great, thank you. And then Julie shared in the in the um, chat that the Oregon Department of Education will have a new DPO, Kai or Kay Turner, starting in August. That's great. All right. If there's nothing else to share, then I think. Oh, Kelly, you keep volunteering yourself. <laughs> yeah. Oh no! I, well, all that means is, is I, I didn't, uh, I didn't unraise my hand, so I, I have, I have nothing. I think it's a different Kelly, actually. Different Kelly. <laughs> it's causing the confusion. Um, I have a question um, about um, a document that was sent out in June, and I forgot to ask about it on the last meeting. It was a new agency-specific price agreement for goods. Does anybody remember that being sent out? Um, uh, this is yes. Kelly. Um, Kelly, yes, I, I, I'm quite familiar with that um, template. So what is the purpose of the, of it? Um, it says it's new agency specific. So what does that mean? So that would be when a single agency um, was to let uh, multiple uh, was to establish a price agreement. In this case, this um, template is for goods to and have multiple vendors under the same price agreement who could provide whatever those goods might be for the agency. This is the the template you would use for that type of solicitation. Okay, so the intent is that it's for your agency. Yes, for a single purchasing. agency awarding to multiple vendors under the same master agreement. Okay, that was my interpretation of it, but I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> Great question, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Okay, um, I think that we will go ahead and adjourn unless there are any other hand raisers or any other Kellys out there. <laughs> nope, 
All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I can't remember what we decided about August. I think we chatted about it last month. Did we decide to cancel? Yes. Yes? Yes. No August meeting. <laughs> Can everybody live without an August meeting? Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm sure the Kellys can. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, there's only two of you, so. OK, so we will meet again in September and a couple of things to be thinking about between now and then. One is, are we going to continue with virtual meetings? Um, is there a desire to have in person meetings? What's it going to look like? So be thinking about that. And then the second item is, um, Melissa will finish her role as chair and I will finish my role as vice chair at the end of this year. So I will become chair on January 1st and I will need a new vice chair. So be thinking about um, people that you might want to nominate or if you are interested in being vice chair. Um, it's a great opportunity to work with the group and um, so just be thinking about that and um, we might be reaching out to tap on somebody if we don't hear from anybody as well. So thanks, everyone. Have a Thank good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.